everyone, and welcome to our latest episode of the AWS She Builds Tech Skills Program. I'm Viru Saboya, and I'm a developer advocate here at AWS. The She Builds Tech Skills Program is designed to create an inclusive and a supportive environment for technical skills development. Our events and our programs, like this one, are focused on technical skills enhancement through hands-on learning for women and those from underrepresented communities. She Builds Tech Skills aims to empower more women to build STEM careers and to develop into future leaders in technology. As always, I'm not alone. I'm very excited to hand over to my co-host, Antonia. Hi, Antonia. Awesome. Thank you very much for this. Uh, yeah, so I'm Antonia. I'm a data scientist uh, in AWS based in Berlin. And today we actually have two guests uh, from a region that we haven't had guests before yet. Uh, so they're both startups SAs in Dubai. And Dubai might ring a bell to some of you uh, from, from our viewers, because Dubai was a region that we just launched this summer from AWS. So Laura, my first question to you, how did you experience the region launch in Dubai? Was there any party that you were able to attend? <laughs> uh, yes, uh, so we did have a did have a lunch party. Uh, it was uh, for breakfast, so all the AWS employees in the region were invited to this uh, uh, breakfast party. There were food, cake, and like uh, um, also some speeches, <laughs> and it was really really nice. It was like loud and nice, and uh, a, a great experience to to have. Perfect. So hard work pays off, especially mm -hmm. uh, when you launch a new region. So that's great. Uh, and the second question to Sobia, um, you are both based in the startup field or working in the startup field. Um, how do you think the startup industry differs from well-established industries in, with regards to the cloud? So my assumption would be that startups are essentially faster and more agile in, in making their decisions. But I would like to hear your opinion on that. Yeah. Um, hi. So uh, I think firstly, you're right. Absolutely. Um, startups are indeed more agile because their major focus is on, on tech. The start startups that we work with, their main focus is on tech. And they also have less uh, technical debt. So that allows them to be a lot more agile. I mm -hmm. think especially since they have to work in a fast paced environment, they have to adapt their needs to changing customer requirements and market changes. They need to be dynamic. Um, they need to to keep on iterating and go over that trial and error process. So um, in that sense, the tech stack that we offer to customers allows them to quickly try on tools as quick as possible and then figure out what works for them, what does not work for them. So I think that's one of the key, um, uh, you know, uh, I think important points to keep in mind when we work with startups, their innovation, their, their pace is really fast and it's, it's awesome whenever we work with customers. Sounds a lot like the AWS culture, like fast paced and dynamic. Um, perfect. So today uh, we have invited you to talk about serverless image resizing and at scale. And maybe we just try to decouple or decompose that, that um, title a bit. So maybe could you define what you understand uh, under serverless? Sure. So. Um when whenever i'm meeting with a lot of startup customers they generally developers and builders and the way that we talk about serverless to them is that they can run uh, their applications without them having to manage the the servers. So unlike what the phrase implies, serverless, that does not mean that servers are not running under the hood. It's more like the customer or whoever who has to who wants to use the serverless technology um, doesn't have to provision the servers. They don't have to manage the servers. That kind of um, task or that process is kind of given to AWS. So we take care of that on their behalf. I understand. Okay. And what do you see is like the major difference between the traditional compute and the serverless um, compute that we offer? Um, yeah, so uh, I'll give like a few examples here uh, just to make it like uh, more clear. So uh, let's assume that uh, you are running your application on a um, traditional environment on a uh, EC2 instance. Uh, so uh, what you need to do is that you need to uh, 
define an auto scaling strategy for your application. So you need to implement all of the best practices to, and uh, like how to scale, uh, scale in and scale out basing on the uh, workloads and on the, the changings in the demand. And in uh, serverless, it is uh, built in capability. So you don't need to worry about auto scaling. It will scale in and out uh, without you needing to like uh, add anything beforehand. And also it's like very quick. Uh, so it uh, scales uh, like in a matter of uh, milliseconds and seconds. So um, this, is, uh, this is like the biggest uh, uh, difference. Uh, we also uh, the same uh, thing. There, uh, there is the same thing for um, the high availability. So in the traditional environment, you still need to uh, implement uh, every uh, all of the best practices for uh, high availability. So you need to assure that your instances are running at uh, at least two availability zones and so on. And uh, with the serverless, it is uh, also a built-in uh, functionality. So uh, you will have your um, uh, workloads in uh, the different uh, availability zones within a region. And um, uh, the last thing that I wanted to mention here is also the um, uh, the, the, the payment, uh, how the payment uh, works. So in the traditional environment, when you have a server, uh, you need to uh, like start the server. And even if you are using the 20 or 30% of it, uh, it's still you need to pay for the whole instance. While in serverless, you actually are paying only for this 20 or 30% that you are actually using. So these are the like major differences between, uh, between serverless and the traditional servers, traditional environments. I see, okay, so you've already mentioned the main benefits. So pay as you go strategy and also the scaling as well as the high availability from, from serverless. But I guess in, in terms of the startup field, it really is also about enabling the startup to only focus on their main product and taking the overhead uh, of, of maintaining all the infrastructure from them, correct? Mm -hmm. exactly. exactly. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, since there's like, again, just to add on to that, if there's like no capacity provisioning or management of those servers, then the startup um, team, tech team can just focus on their code. They can focus on what really matters to them um, while we kind of take care of all of that, uh, you know, uh, heavy lifting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then probably my last question would be also regarding, um, so I always hear about serverless in the context of compute. Uh, so does serverless always refer to compute instances or is, is it also applicable uh, to other fields of com uh, cloud computing? Uh, um, no, so it is uh, available for compute, but it's also available for storage and also for integration uh, services. Um, so, uh, for example, when it comes to compute, uh, we do have the AWS uh, Lambda. So you can run uh, your uh, Lambda functions in uh, in a language, uh, in a programming language uh, that you prefer, and you can uh, uh, run some like uh, processing fun uh, processing. Uh, um, the, I don't know, like uh, proce processing. Uh, you can process your workloads actually with the with the Lambda. You can run like any type of function. You can create microservices. You can. Uh, uh, do many many of different stuff and uh, the uh, also the uh, benefit of it uh, is as I said it has all the uh, functionality and best practices already built in uh, you can uh, run it on schedule or based on like a different uh, uh, event so whenever something has happened in your account you can run this you can this lambda function can be triggered uh, also we uh, do have um, um, like serverless uh, options for storage uh, so for example here we can mention the um, 
uh, Amazon S3, the uh, object storage uh, that we do have in uh, AWS, uh, which can be used for also a uh, like wide variety of purposes. Uh, and um, uh, also here, you don't need to worry about managing the uh, capacity uh, and the storage infrastructure. Uh, it will uh, scale uh, on demand. So if you use more, uh, it will just like scale automatically and uh, also like uh, get uh, yeah, and you will be like uh, paying only for the storage and like for the API calls that you are actually using. So you don't need to over provision storage, uh, uh, even like if you are not using it. And we, yeah, we do also have for integration uh, services, uh, like uh, serverless options for in the integration services, like for example, um, SQS, it's our uh, simple queue service. Uh, that can be used to uh, receive, send, and uh, temporary store messages uh, between uh, two different software components. So it can help you build um, loosely coupled uh, and um, uh, yeah, loosely coupled uh, application and like uh, microservices. And um, uh, yeah, so you don't need to wait for the other component to be uh, ready to process the messages uh, of uh, that, that are being uh, added to the queue. Like it's a kind of a buffer. Mm -hmm. awesome. I don't know. Yeah, do you want to add anything here? No, I think <laughs> I think you've covered it really well. Um, we will actually revisit some of the points that you've mentioned when we um, go into the the demo and the architecture. But uh, yeah. Yeah, how about diving into the to the use case that you've brought uh, today uh, for us? Okay, sure. Okay, so I will then uh, show you guys the the diagram. All right. Um, so this basically uh, architecture diagram that you're seeing here focuses mainly on resizing images, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't mean that um, these architectural components or these services that we're using here, which are serverless services that Laura just mentioned, can be only used for resizing images. For instance, you can replace the um, in this case we're resizing it. Maybe the images should be changed in different sizes to map, let's say, design constraints on a mobile app or let's say a web application, there could be other situations where you would want to add um, trademarks to a real estate property. Um, so that is where you might want to use these serverless options to um, basically change trademarking on images. So the idea really is that using the same services, you can essentially um, incorporate a number of use cases. So it all depends on what you want to do. Um, so we have over here um, a nice little naughty cat. Um, and so we're going to upload uh, 10,000 images to um, our object storage component, also known as Amazon S3. And uh, this particular architecture is event-driven focused. So that means in case if a, event, a specific event takes place, in this case, an image is uploaded to a bucket, we will then trigger an action. And that action is, I want to resize my images. Um, and since it's 10,000, we want to also see that this actually can handle the resizing um, process at scale. So um, once we upload the images here in S3, the action is then uh, triggered which is where a Lambda function will uh, resize the images and we'll see how that uh, component looks like. But this is essentially a serverless compute option that we offer so customers can run code um, in certain languages that they want for a very short task or process. Now, once that's uh, that um, uh, task is done, resizing is done, we do two things at once. One thing is that we store the resized images to another S3 bucket. And second, we um, push the, or rather we, we uh, send um, a message to this queue. Uh, so what happens Sorry, in this Maybe case... I can interrupt you in that case. We have a question yeah. from the audience um, asking, why would you store the image before processing? 
So this is basically, uh, it's just uh, an example shown over here of how we can trigger uh, the, the Lambda function. Um, it's better, in some cases, customers want to store both the raw um, images and the resize images just to keep both yeah. at hand. This is just one, I think, example to show you how you could interact with these services, not necessarily that you have to store the images. For example, you could actually place instead of an S3 bucket here, you could put in an API and the API receives the image payload and then you can directly send it to the function to do the processing or whatever task that you want to do. So um, this is just an example, but not a um, hard practice that you should follow or otherwise you can't use the service like that. So um, just just one um, example that we put up just for easier sakes of demoing. Yeah, yeah I, I double... Uh emphasize that part of logging stuff and storing the raw image separately as a data scientist this is like key uh, for, for my daily uh, business okay there's another question um so what action would s3 trigger to alert lambda and why wouldn't you use sqs to going into the function already so firstly, I think just to um, um, tackle the first part of the question, what action would S3 trigger to alert Lambda? We can essentially uh, look for an API call that says put object, and we can connect that trigger with our Lambda function. On the other hand, you can either look for that trigger or have a uh, another, let's say, um, serverless, like let's say, uh, option place, which is event bridge, it's a rule. So you can have a rule that you're looking for, and then you can also trigger this. So there's different ways that you can look into how you could trigger this operation. The other thing is, why wouldn't you use an SQS to, to going into the function? Absolutely, you can put an SQS, you can put a definitely, you can put a queue in between uh, an S3 bucket and a Lambda function. In fact, this makes a lot more sense when you want, when you have large amounts of images that are coming in and you want to handle uh, buffering, um, so that images are still processed, but you're not really reaching throttling limits or some sort of um, other issues. So this is something that is possible. I think we've just arranged it in this way just for the just to show how simple and easy it is for people to get started. But if you want to place an SQS queue, and that is actually um, uh, something that makes sense from the use case perspective, I think you can definitely do that. Cool. Thank you for answering the questions. No worries. Thank you. So um, I think, uh, so yeah, once the resizing part is done, uh, the next two things that happen is that we store the newly resized images in the S3 bucket, and we send a part to the, uh, of the resized image to the SQS uh, queue. So Laura mentioned already, this is a queue service, so we can send messages, we can receive messages, but essentially the idea really is, is that we are decoupling our environment and that the two Lambda functions we have here are just interacting with the queue itself, but not with each other. So this is just one way of um, making a better architectural uh, decision. Um, then once that um, message has arrived, the Lambda function is just going to interact with this queue, the second Lambda function, and we can use it for other business logic. Um, however, let's say if um, it is unable to process a, the message that's come into this queue um, and it's failed for some reason, we will then pass a message to this second queue, which is a dead letter queue. Um, and then you can use this for troubleshooting purposes. Maybe the path uh, to that image does not exist and that's why it failed, it can't find the image. Or maybe the message um, that has come into this queue has exceeded its limit. There could be many different reasons, but we're trying to show here that you can also have another queue for error handling purposes. Um, also wait a minute in case there are any questions, but if not, or um, then I'll also hand it over to Laura to see it in action. Is um, having a DLQ a recommended best practice? Yes, I think uh, definitely from a troubleshooting per, uh, perspective, you should have a DLQ, uh, a dead letter queue. 
um, it really does help because there could be a number of different reasons, especially when things are in production, you should have something in place that can still connect uh, collect these types of messages. And then you can look into why this is happening um, because things often break, everything fails all the time and you should um, look into why there could be certain reasons why it's not working. So I would highly recommend having a DLQ. Okay, so I don't see any question from the audience for now. So maybe Laura, we jump in hands on and start sure. the demo. I'll share my screen then. Um, okay, uh, so uh, we, okay, so um, I will start with the uh, S3 bucket that uh, Sahobia talks about uh, in the in the beginning. So uh, we have like two different S3 buckets, uh, one uh, Edward Shebuild serverless demo, and uh, you can see here that is empty. And this is the bucket where we'll be uh, storing the uh, our raw photos. And we do have another uh, S3 bucket. It is the AWS Shield Serverless Demo resized uh, bucket, where we will be storing the uh, resized photos. So you can see also that uh, the number of objects is zero. And um, uh, yeah, so uh, let me uh, let me add now the uh, photos uh, um, uh, that we uh, can um, resize. Uh, so uh, here uh, I have a folder that is called draw and um, uh, we do have like uh, 10,000, more than 10,000 uh, uh, of uh, uh, GPG files here. And uh, I will, with one command, with the uh, AWS CLI command, I will copy these uh, uh, pictures into the S3 bucket, the uh, and uh, I will do that into the row folder. So the uh, command is the uh, AWS S3 CP, just like to copy uh, the row folder into the uh, this path, uh, this S. Wow. Maybe you can zoom in a bit, Laura, because the oh, font okay. size is very small. Yeah, much better, thanks. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so uh, I will be copying the row folder with all the files inside it uh, into this uh, uh, S3 location. Uh, so uh, let's do that. Quick question, why did you decide to use the CLI to uh, upload the images uh, compared to the regular S3 console uh, option? Uh, yes, uh, I uh, do it with the CLI uh, for because like I have a lot of photos and the uh, uh, the size of this uh, photos actually uh, exceeds the um, five gigabyte uh, that can be uploaded uh, like it at once. And this uh, needs to be done with a multi-part upload. And this command will uh, do that for me uh, under the hood. Yeah, I suppose it's also faster than through the console, right? Exactly. So I will need, like, uh, if I need to do it in the console, uh, actually the multi-part uploads. So I will need to do it manually, actually upload like different parts. Uh, so uh, that's why I use the uh, Adobe CLI. We, I can also use the uh, SDK for mm -hmm. uh, for the multi-part upload. And um, uh, here in the uh, this bucket, uh, when I refresh, I can see that I have the row folder and I have the uh, photos coming in. And um, what, uh, what's happening now is that uh, the Lambda that is used for resizing and that is getting triggered when the uh, new data is added to the S3 bucket uh, is, uh, uh, is actually running now. Uh, it's called the resizing function. And uh, as Saubia mentioned, what it basically does, it uh, downloads the photo, it resizes it, and it put it in the resized bucket. And also later, it send it to send the path of the photo in the resized S3 bucket uh, to the SQS queue. Uh, so uh, what can I uh, show you here is that um, uh, in the uh, second bucket, the resized bucket, uh, when I refresh it, I see the resized folder uh, has been created. And inside it, we have the uh, also like uh, photos. Uh, so um, 
you can see the difference in the size. So here the average size is like um, uh, 450 kilobytes, uh, 300, 166, uh, 450 and so on. And in the resized bucket, uh, we have like oh, wow. 10 okay. kilobytes, uh, 8 kilobytes, 7, 29. And uh, you can see that these photos are actually uh, being resized um, and uh, you can we can also take a look into the uh, lambda function uh, you can uh, see some uh, uh, metrics in the monitoring tab uh, so just let me refresh it um, okay maybe it's um, give me a second okay uh, because I opened it uh, much earlier. Uh, so you can see here that the um, success rate for now is like 100% and the errors uh, is uh, like the error is zero. Mm -hmm. And uh, here, like you can see the number of invocations, the duration of uh, like the average duration of uh, uh, running uh, this Lambda function. Uh, and when you go to the logs of this... Are you uh, back? How, how mm -hmm. long does it take to process one image in Lambda then with the execution? Okay, so we can see like here the maximum duration. Okay, let's see. It's two point duration. Uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, 1.4 millisecond. And uh, yeah, because like it's in the millisecond and the uh, average duration is uh, uh, 437. Ah, now here it's I think one second uh, yeah. point four. Yeah, sorry. I uh, okay. so uh, yes, and the minimum is um, uh, two hundred and three milliseconds. Um, yeah, and you can see also in CloudWatch uh, when you go to the uh, logs of this function, we can refresh it here, and uh, we can see that uh, the last log group. Uh, so here the lambda starts at this moment. Uh, here it prints some debugging uh, options that we do have. Uh, and uh, just like to show you that it's, uh, um, it's working. And here it is the, the, when it ends. And it also gives the reports like it runs for 300 uh, milliseconds. Yeah. And that the uh, memory size of the Lambda function, the build duration, and so on. Can we maybe have a look or take a look at the Lambda function itself that's resizing in the image? Uh, the mm -hmm. audience is asking. And there's also a second question. Uh, I think that should be feasible from the code to uh, set a target uh, to only target files that are over a certain size. So I think this would be a regular if statement, yes. correct? Exactly. So whenever uh, a Lambda function is triggered uh, by an, uh, by this put event, so whenever like one uh, photo or object is added to it, the S3 uh, bucket, uh, Lambda can read this, um, this file, can read the metadata of this file. So it can, uh, uh, you can access the metadata, you can see like uh, how big is this file and if it is more than uh, uh, X, uh, resize it if not just uh just go with it so um um yeah and uh, what was the first uh, first question it's just about describing the lambda function um okay so describing the the code here that's what's happening yeah maybe just in a, in a minute or two we can have a quick okay. look yeah sure uh so uh here actually starts the um uh, the, the Lambda handler function that is getting the event and the context. So the event will, uh, like in the event, we will have like different records. And uh, in this uh, record, we can access like the S3 record, the bucket, the name, just to save the bucket name, uh, just to save the key. And the key will be the name of the object. And uh, later, like how we did it is that um, uh, for for each uh file that we are getting we will be actually uh like uh downloading it saving it in the uh, temporary folder that the lambda does have and we will stamp it with the uh 
like a uh, an I like unique ID, and uh, we will then send it to the resize photo. And for that, we are using the um, uh, we are importing the uh, pillow of, uh, library for um, uh, for Python. And uh, here we is the resizing image, uh, the function for resizing the image. So we are creating the like a uh, thumbnail, and here you can like um, make it. For example, here we make it half the uh, uh, half the size, but uh, you can uh, you can put something else here. And we save this photo, and later we give it back to the main function, and we. Uh, put it in the S3 bucket. Uh, here we upload the file to the S3 bucket, and later in the uh, we send a message to the SQS with the ARN uh, to the uh, of the uh, uh, of this resized image in the new S3 bucket. So here we handle some exceptions and. Uh, so this is mainly it. And um, okay, so should I continue? Are there like uh, any other questions regarding this? I think for now there are no other questions. But do you have one? No, I just want to note quickly because uh, Sabia, you did mention earlier on that this is just in Python, but you can actually write in any other language you want. Well, supported languages on Lambda. Do you know if there are, is there any way that people can go and look up sample code that can help them get going? Is that normally? Yeah. I, uh, uh, yeah? Yeah, um, sorry to interrupt. I, I was just going to say, yeah, definitely. So we usually have uh, blog posts that are available. We also have the AWS Lambda documentation. And generally in these documentations, we have tutorials or sample code. So in fact, for Lambda, we um, support a number of languages, one of them being Python, there's Java, there's Node.js. And so if suppose it's trying to tackle a certain problem, we will generally have tabs with different languages and you can look at how you would write or use Lambda Lambda in those cases. So we have a few supported languages and you can try looking at AWS Lambda documentation. There's blog posts available. There's also YouTube videos like this one, or there's uh, definitely GitHub samples. So try, there's, there's quite a lot of uh, out there. Great. Sure. Thank you so much. Awesome. So I'd say before wrapping up, final question. Um, so there is the question how to integrate the Lambda function on S3 bucket. So I guess it's about how to add the trigger. Uh... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can do it like when you create a Lambda function right here uh, and you go like you create a Lambda function. Let's say here, create a function. Uh, you can like um, you can use some blueprints and uh, so on, and uh, you can like add the function name, and um, uh, I think like not in advanced settings, but after like you created, uh, you can add the trigger here, so you can add the source of the trigger, and uh, you can uh, you can add the details like which bucket, uh, which folder, uh, what's the um, API um, call that uh, needs to be um, uh, that will trigger this event. Awesome. Same for the destination. Perfect. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for for your uh, guest talk today, Salvia and Laura. Uh, I think everyone uh, learned a lot, and and we enjoyed that uh, hands-on demo. And it was so much fun. Exactly. And now, yeah. Vilisva, why is this time of the year fun time at AWS? Do you have something that you can share? Yes, it is an exciting time. So. You probably have seen us talk about this all over social media, yes. but <laughs> reInvent is coming up end of next month. Uh, we will be uh, at Las Vegas and uh, the event will be on for a, week, uh, for a week. It'll be my first time going. I'm very excited about it. So if you are watching and you're going to be there, do let us know in the chat how you're going to be there. If not, some of the sessions are actually going to be available virtually. So when you go to register, don't be so stressed out if you will, are not able to attend. You can actually still access some of the sessions virtually. So there's that coming up. And then our next uh, announcement is 
a show exactly like this one. So this is AWS She Builds Tech Skills EMEA. So it's an it's an, it's an, it's an EMEA friendly time of the day. There is an AWS She Builds Tech Skills North America that's also being launched. You'll see the uh, the URL that we're showing there. You can access that and you can actually just read up more about that. When will the shows uh, when will the show be on and and when can you actually join and take part in that as well? That's the next uh, announcement that we have. And then our last announcement, you know, we meet every month and we get together and we have exciting guests like we had today. And we have our next one coming up in November, just before reInvent. We'll have our next guest and we'll talk about security in the cloud. Awesome. Sounds like a good appetizer before a reInvent is happening and all the AWS things are coming yes. up. Yes, <laughs> very exciting. <laughs> All right. That is that for me. I see there's one, how do you get the code being used? Uh, I see there's one last question and I saw an, uh, a link that was shared by the uh, earlier on. I don't know, Krish, uh, sorry, if you can just, uh, just scroll back. We did share a link on how to get started. That's where you'll be able to see sample codes and where to actually access them. I hope this answers your question. Perfect. All right, then. Uh, see you, everyone, on November 22nd. And thanks again, Sorbia, Laura, and also Veliswa and the moderators behind the scenes uh, for, for joining us today. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to our guests. Thank you for joining. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Bye-bye.